I was really feeling low last summer. Some people think ministers don't have problems, but we do. Sometimes big ones. I was missing one of our sons who is estranged from us. I missed his little daughters especially, our only grandchildren. My wife and I were thinking about moving. I was already feeling uprooted from a home I have loved. I was having trouble placing a couple of books I wanted to get published. It didn't matter that I had others coming out. These, these were the ones I especially wanted to see in print. One of our dear friends, a young girl of 16, was having life-threatening surgery. Another friend reported that her medication was no longer working and she was losing her battle with cancer. One morning, I didn't want to get out of bed. It all seemed too much. Then I thought about how my life has been blessed. My wife and I had our health. We still had one son who loved us and wanted to be with us. We had all the money we needed. We had a comfortable home. We loved the taste of our food and a good cup of coffee at breakfast. How ungrateful I am, I thought. I have so much more than nine-tenths of the other people in the world. What kind of ingrate am I? that I'm feeling depressed by these things. I began to think about all the things I should be grateful for, and immediately I began to feel better. I remembered St. Paul's words to the Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then he said, do not quench the spirit. I wondered if Somehow the two things were related, giving thanks and not quenching the Spirit. Does the sense of God's Spirit in us come from giving thanks? I could believe it because the minute I began being grateful again, my spirit perked up. You know, it's almost impossible to be grateful for everything in our lives and to feel blue and depressed at the same time. Try it and You'll see for yourself, you can't do both at the same time. There's always something to feel grateful for. One of my favorite books for years has been Sabina Wurmbrand's story, The Pastor's Wife. Sabina's husband, Richard, was a Christian pastor in Romania. When the Russians came after World War II, they put him in prison for believing in God and preaching his faith. Sabina was in prison too, and their young son had to be cared for by friends. One day, as the women prisoners were marched along the road from the factory where they performed forced labor back to their bleak, comfortless dormitory, a friend of Sabina's surreptitiously plucked two raspberries growing beside the road and carried them along in the palm of her hand. When they got back to the dormitory, she opened her hand, showed them to Sabina, and gave her one of them. They were so delighted with those two lonely, partially crushed little raspberries because they didn't have anything else. I think of that sometimes when I feel like complaining because I don't like what I'm eating or I'm tired of wearing the clothes I've been wearing or can't find a TV program I want to watch. Two lonely little raspberries, and I feel like a dog if I can't find gratitude in my heart. The world is an arena for gratitude. There's always so much around us for which to give thanks. It's like what our Buddhist friends call awareness, merely being present to the richness of all things to the stupendous wealth of being alive and being able to see and hear and feel and taste things. If we were only truly aware, truly sensitive to everything, it would blow all our fuses in an instant. We couldn't bear the overwhelming number of gifts. Do you remember a book several years ago by an American Indian named William Heast, Leet, uh, Least Heat Moon? It's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? Heat moon. The book was called Blue Highways. 
Heat Moon had just lost his job as an English professor and didn't have anything better to do, so he got in his old van that he had named Ghost Dancing and drove all over the country following the highways marked in blue on the map, the back roads, never the interstate highways. And he wrote about the richness of what he encountered. Even in the desert of West Texas, he found things to celebrate. One day, he drove out there just to look and listen and learn what was there. Everybody said there was nothing out there, but he knew better. And he made a list of the things he found there. There were 30 items on his list. A mockingbird, a, a morning dove, gray flies, a blue bumblebee, black ants, orange ants, orange and black ants. What's been going on, he asked. An opossum skull some cactus, a jackrabbit. He didn't see it, but he could see where it had been gnawing on the cactus. Some mesquite plants, the earth and the sky and the wind, always the wind, he said. And some people said there was nothing out there. Awareness, being present to the world around us, feeling it, seeing it, listening to it, caring about it being grateful for it. It really can heal your spirit, can't it? It's something that we're just alive, and whether we're artists or poets or only ordinary folks, we can enjoy everything and give thanks for it. In the end, when we die, maybe we'll be judged not by what we accomplished during our lifetimes, the, the jobs we held, the music or the books we wrote, the recipes we invented, and all that, but by how thankful we were to have lived. Somehow, as I grow older, that seems important to me. I don't want to die as one who wasn't grateful, who didn't appreciate everything while he had it. Above all, I'm grateful for Christ and what he taught us about living. Aren't you? It has made a difference in my life. I had a nice long conversation on the telephone recently with a minister friend of mine named Barry Howard. Barry was once one of my students. He's now a pastor in Pensacola, Florida. He was telling me that he's writing a book about his experiences with people who were dying. He's going to call it Pushing Up Daisies. He may change that now that there's a television program by something very near that. He told me one of the stories he wants to put in this book. It's about a man in his late 70s who had been in the hospital several days awaiting death. In the middle of the night, Barry's phone rang. It was the man's wife. They just called her from the hospital to say that the end was near. Would he please come by and pick her up and go with her? In the hospital room, her son and daughter were already by the bedside. Her husband lay there, his eyes shut, an oxygen mask on his face. Once or twice, he, he seemed to be struggling with the mask, and his son reached out and straightened it and moved his hand away. The third or fourth time, Barry said, wait a minute, maybe he wants it off so he can say something. He did want to say something. Hold my hand, he murmured huskily to his wife. She took his hand and stood by the bed. The mask was restored, and this time he lay quietly, content to be holding his wife's hand. Then, very gently and soothingly, the wife began to sing. It was an old hymn called Victory in Jesus. Before she'd sung very much, her daughter joined in and sang alto. And then the son, who'd been crying, began to sing tenor. When they finished that song, they sang, Great is thy faithfulness. And when they finished that, they began singing Amazing Grace. They were on the last verse of Amazing Grace. You know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, when the lifeline on the bedside monitor went flat and the man was gone. It was an amazing experience, said Barry. When they entered the room, there had been pain and suffering and tension. But now, when the man died to the strains of those familiar old hymns, 
There was joy and composure and even thanksgiving. Everything was good, life, death, everything. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And all we can say is, thanks be to God for the unspeakable gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.